So we're moving on to our next set of notes in unit six on learning and this set of notes being on operant conditioning. So we're moving away from classical conditioning and now we're gonna talk about operant and really describe what that means and what the different schedules and reinforcement and punishment looks like. Let's first talk about a comparison between operant and classical conditioning. Classical conditioning forms associations between two stimuli. So between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. So as Pavlov's dogs, the, the, the dogs associated the sound of the bell with the food and therefore they responded. So a big mistake that a lot of students make is saying that the dog will associate the bell with salivating and therefore they salivate. No, no, it's gotta be two stimuli and that the dog hears the bell, so they think about the food, which makes them salivate. Okay, so as is shown in the top of the diagram here, um, a splash of water on the sea snail, they associate the splash with a tail shock, being the unconditioned stimulus, and therefore they, they respond to the splash of water. In operant conditioning, on the other hand, you form associations between behaviors and their resulting events. So let's say Pavlov's dogs are being operantly conditioned, not classically conditioned, and you as the experimenter, as the owner of your dog, right, you say, sit. When the dog sits their bum on the ground and they get a treat, the dog is associating, oh wow, every time I put my butt on the floor, I get a yummy snack. So they're associating sitting on the floor with the yummy snack those two things, the behavior and the resulting event or the consequence, right? As is shown in the diagram down here. The seal here putting his, balancing the ball on his nose, right? That's the response and he gets a fish as a consequence. Now, a lot of times we think consequence with a bad connotation, like, ooh, that's bad. Well, not necessarily. A consequence can be positive because it's just the result of what you just did, which is your response. Okay, so which means then the response is strengthened. The dog or the seal is gonna wanna do that again. Which is kind of what E.L. Thorndike was talking about with the law of effect. That was a really good segue. Um, responses, so Thorndike said that responses that produce desirable results will be learned or stamped into the organism. Okay, so this is very, very simple. Kudos to Thorndike for putting a term to this incredibly simple concept that when a response is followed by a desirable result, the response will be repeated. It's going to be stamped into the organism. So he found that hungry cats in a puzzle box, much like this one, would work diligently to solve the puzzle by trial and error to obtain the food reward outside the box. And that they are solving a problem right, because they are being rewarded to do so. Gradually on succeeding trials, erroneous or wrong responses were eliminated and effective responses were strengthened because every time they got the correct response, they were rewarded. So they think to themselves, oh, I gotta remember what I just did and I'll do it again because I get a reward every time. This is, op that's, that's the law of effect essentially. So B.F. Skinner was the one who kind of coined operant conditioning with what he called the operant chamber. He used Thorndike's law of effect as a starting point and he developed the operant chamber or also called the Skinner box to study operant conditioning and he used it with mice in that there was a certain like combination of things that the mouse had to do in order to be rewarded with sugar water. And each time that they did the correct combination of whatever they had to do with the lever, or the, the light or whatever it was, that was strengthened and they got better at it because they were being rewarded. So the opera chamber Skinner box comes with a bar or a key that an animal manipulates to obtain the food or the water reinforcer. So it's connected to devices that record the animal's responses and allows the researcher to have complete control over the animal's environment and that they can do a combination of like the light or the lever, whatever it is, until the mouse is rewarded. Shaping is kind of an extension of operant conditioning and we're talking about it now because it's rather simple before we get into the nuts and bolts of operant conditioning. So shaping, it's an operant conditioning procedure where reinforcers 
guide behavior closer towards a target behavior through successive approximations. So a rat is shaped to sniff mines. You don't just look at the rat and say, go find all the mines and they just go do it. No, you have to take baby steps, right? Shaping is like baby steps. Or a manatee is shaped to discriminate objects with different shapes, colors, and sizes, as a dog can be too. A dog knows the difference between their toys, right? And this is by learning one toy at a time. Um, let's say you have a dog at home in a long driveway and you want to teach your dog to go retrieve your newspaper at the end of the driveway if this weren't the digital age where everything's online, right? Um, you don't just say to your dog, Rover, go get the newspaper and they go get it. No, you have to teach them. You probably have to teach them how to pick up the newspaper without you know, ripping it. You have to teach them what it means to go to the end of the driveway and then to come back. It's little baby, step, uh, little baby steps of shaping along the way with reinforcements. There are different types of reinforcers and it's any event that strength, strengthens the behavior it follows. So a heat lamp positively reinforces a meerkat's behavior in the cold. They understand that, ooh, I'm gonna get this warmth, right? If I do a backflip or whatever it is a meerkat can do that's funny, right? This little chart here gives a glimpse of what we're about to go over. The operant conditioning terms being positive and negative reinforcements what they do, and then some possible examples. I encourage you to pause and kind of look over those, but in the next couple slides, I'm gonna be explaining them a little more. However, this is a good reference from, for you. I would definitely write this down. So the other types of reinforcers are primary and secondary, and this is just a difference of how we learn for things to reinforce us. A primary reinforcer is innate, meaning we are born to be reinforced by this stimulus. It's innately, innately reinforcing stimulus that usually satisfies some biological need, like food or drink, okay? Like if I say Chipotle to all of you, your ears kind of perk up and you're like, what do I have to do to get Chipotle for free? <laughs> um, that would be a biological reinforcer um, because it's food. A conditioned, better known as a secondary reinforcer, this is a learned reinforcer. So we don't come out of the womb understanding what George Washington's face on a green piece of paper with a one on it means, right? We learn what money means and it becomes a very strong but secondary reinforcer for us later in life. Just like grades or even praise from your teacher or from your parents or a smile or applause, all of these things we learn to like. Um, so it gets its reinforcing power through its association with a primary reinforcer, essentially. Then there's immediate and delayed reinforcers, which we're going to talk about this some more probably in the next video. An immediate reinforcer is one that occurs closely to a behavior in time. So a rat gets a food pellet for a bar press immediately. So that's an immediate reinforcer. A delayed reinforcer is one that's delayed in time for a certain behavior. So a paycheck that comes at the end of a week. So you're working on Monday knowing that on Friday you're gonna get paid. We may be more inclined to engage in small immediate reinforcers like watching TV than large delayed reinforcers like getting an A in a course, which requires consistent study, right? And there's probably, there's a ton of research out there about the immediate gratification era that we are in and your generation needing immediate gratification in order to stick with anything. Um, I highly encourage you to do some reading on that. Okay, here's where we're gonna talk about some of the nuts and bolts of operant conditioning. Two terms here being positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. First, I want you to over in the margin write what reinforcements or reinforcers do. Reinforcers always, always, every single time, no matter what, a reinforcer will increase behavior, hence the arrows here on the slide, right? Reinforcers will increase the behavior. So what you have to ask yourself is, is whatever this reward or is this consequence, is this consequence, whatever it is, going to increase the behavior? If it does, it's a reinforcement. Then we have to talk about the difference between positive and negative. I want you to get out of your minds that positive is positive or good and that negative is bad. Get rid of that, that's not what it means. 
okay? So a positive reinforcement, it will increase the response, because it's a reinforcement, by adding or giving a positive stimulus. Okay, so it all I want you to understand with positive is that it adds a stimulus. Okay, positive reinforcement will add a stimulus, but you have to ask yourself, what is it going to add in order to increase the behavior? So it's a positive reinforcement. So we know as a reinforcement, it's gonna increase behavior. If it's positive, ask yourself, what do I have to add in order to increase behavior? Well, it's gotta be a positive stimulus of some sort. So you get five bucks for every annual report card or candy for every right answer in class. So um, if you, let's say you meet your curfew on Saturday night and your parents say, I'm going to add some chores. Great job, you, and meeting your curfew. You think to yourself, well, that's not gonna make me wanna meet my curfew again. That's because it's not a positive reinforcement, right? It's adding something but it's not increasing your behavior, therefore it's not a reinforcement. So you have to be adding a positive stimulus in order for it to increase behavior. I would encourage you at this point to pause or rewind if you need further clarification on that or if you need to clarify it in your notes. Please pause. Moving right along with negative reinforcement, and it's kind of the same idea. It's gonna increase a response or increase behavior but not by good or bad or adding, but by taking away or subtracting something. Negative reinforcement is very difficult to understand because we think it's gonna increase behavior, but we're taking something away? How does that make sense at all? Well, here's the thing. You're removing an aversive stimulus an aversive being bad, right? So you take aspirin, that being the behavior, to relieve a headache. A headache is an aversive stimulus. If it goes away, woo, I'm gonna take aspirin again next time I have a headache. Or faking an illness to avoid going to school. And if it works, right, um, it's gonna take away school, therefore you're gonna fake an illness even more. Or using an umbrella to keep from getting wet. The um, using the umbrella being the behavior that's increased because you take away the rain. Here's the thing, just like with positive reinforcement, you have to ask yourself, okay, it's a reinforcement, so it's gonna increase behavior. So if it's taking something away, hence it's negative. If it's taking something away, what do I have to take away in order to increase behavior? So let's take the scenario I gave you before. Let's say you meet curfew and you walk in and your parents say, you don't have to do chores for the next two days. You don't have to do any chores for the next two days. You're like, yeah, I can like watch TV or, you know, I don't know, scrapbook or go out with my friends or I don't know, whatever you all do, right? That will increase behavior because you're taking away an aversive stimulus. Again, I would encourage you to pause, rewind, go over, clarify in your notes. Make sure you understand this before moving on.